Well, good morning. Great to see you here this morning. How many of you are happy to be in God's house? If you're happy to be in God's house this morning, stand on your head. I was waiting to see if anybody was going to do that. I was. That, I would have. That would have been great. Alex, were you going to do that? Oh, he was. Uh, Alex is really glad to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Well, it's great to have you here this morning. Glad that you're here. If you go ahead and stand with me this morning. And uh, just let those people who are watching on uh, Facebook Live this morning, if you have any requests uh, that you'd like us to pray for during prayer time, please make those known in the comment section, and we'll make sure that we do that as we go to prayer later on this morning. But before we do anything else, go ahead and turn around and find somebody that you have not said hi to this morning and wave to them. Welcome, everybody, into the house of the Lord this morning.
the Heart of Worship, and it's one that um, actually came out in 1999, so most of us have probably sung it numerous times throughout our life. Um, and this week, as I was going through, I just did kind of a quick look up of the history behind the song. I was just curious. Um, I don't know about you, but sometimes I do that. Um, this song was written by Matt Redman, and um, as I was reading the story behind it, uh, what he kind of said was, in the late 1990s, the pastor of his church noticed that their congregation was struggling to find that true meaning of worship. And so the pastor basically got rid of the sound system and got rid of the band. Um, and when he told the church about it, he posed this question. He said, when you come through the doors on Sunday, what are you bringing as your offering to God? See, their, their worship team was was so much a part of that church that people were coming to just constantly be filled, but were forgetting that worship is about what you're bringing to Christ. And so that initial question was met with what he considered silent embarrassment. Um, and he said after, after a time of their church was only singing a cappella songs and just lifting up prayers and part of their worship, they reintroduced the musicians and the sound system but he said when it was all said and done, they had gained a new perspective that worship was all about Jesus. So this morning as we sing this song, I want to challenge each of us, if you know this song, just close your eyes and just really focus on stripping everything away um, and putting all the stress of your life, all the stress of what's going on in the world, what's going on around us, just take all of that and just put all of that out of your mind and just focus on this amazing Christ, this amazing God that we worship.
powerful reminder of why we come, why we give our worship to him, who we give our worship to. Mighty reminder that when we come, we may have preconceived ideas, but it's all about him and what we bring to him and what he wants us to bring to him is our whole selves as we come. In just a moment, we're going to go to our prayer time and we're going to open up our altars for you to come forward and to spend some time with God this morning because that's what his desire is. He wants us to spend time with him. You can do that there in the pew as you're sitting during the service, but we also offer this time that you can come and do that during this time as well. And as we go to prayer this morning, we want to lift up some requests that have come into the church. We want to think of Larry and Jeannie Piety and their health. Just ask that you just continue to pray for them. Ask that you would pray for uh, Linda Showalter told us about a friend of hers named Mike who passed away this past week with COVID. Just ask that you would pray for Mike's family during this time. Pastor Elaine and Jennifer and their family are on vacation this morning. They're probably in Colorado. They're headed to Utah. And uh, so they're going to be gone for just a little time away. So we ask that you would pray for them. I ask that you would continue to pray for Sharon Benninger as she recovers from her surgery. I ask that you would pray for uh, Jalen's family. Jalen's family is, is going through some rough times right now. And it's just asking that we would just lift them up and ask God to do a wonderful work in their family. I also ask that you would just pray for the unrest that's going on in our world today. And uh, just ask that God would just somehow come and just do a great work and bring peace in those areas. And uh, we have this board over here that has people's names on that we have put on there several years ago that do not know Christ. And I just ask that we would recommit ourselves to praying for those names on that board, those who are lost in our community, those who do not know Christ. And we just ask that you would just lift them up in prayer as well. So as the team leads us in another course, our altars are open. We encourage you to come and spend some time this morning. Just you and the Lord.
Lord, we come to you this morning. And as we take a moment and pause before you, Lord, we just pray that you would just speak to us. Lord, in Scripture it says, search me. And Lord, as we take this time this morning, I would just ask that you would just search inside all of us. That Lord, if there are things within inside of us that shouldn't be there, we ask that you would take them out. But Lord, we also ask that if there are things inside of us that are causing anxiety or fear or whatever it might be, Lord, that you would just take those away as well. Lord, we come to you this morning and we, we lean upon you. We give ourselves to you, Lord, asking you to guide and direct us. Asking, Lord, for those who have been mentioned in prayers this morning and many more, Lord, that are facing difficult situations, Lord, that you would just be with them as well during this time. We lift up those whose health need restored. We think of Larry and Jeannie and we think of Sharon this morning. We just lift them to you asking that you do a great work of healing in their life right now. We pray for those who have lost loved ones, but we pray for them for Linda's friend Mike and Linda's family as he has passed away this week. So we just ask, Lord, that you would just bring great comfort to them. Just be with them during this time. We pray for Pastor Lane and Jennifer and their family as they are headed out for vacation. Lord, we pray for safety for them. We ask that you would just give them a great time to be together as family, to relax and to be renewed. And so, Lord, we just lift them to you this morning as well. Lord, we pray for Jalen's family as they are going through a, a rough time right now. A lot of things coming against them. A lot of things, Lord, that are that are fighting against them. And we just ask that you would just help them to be strong. And Lord, that you will bring healing into that family. Lord, we pray for our world. There are so many things going on right now. So much unsettledness, so much hatred. And Lord, I just pray that you will just come upon us and that you will bring calm and peace. Lord, that you will help us to, to have, find unity instead of being disjointed. And so, Lord, we just, we just pray for our world right now. Lord, we lift up those names that are on our board, those who do not know you. Lord and Savior, those who are, who are still trying to get through life without acceptance of you into their life. And Lord, we lift them up to you. Every single name that's on that board, names that are not appearing on that board. Lord, may you just, may you just speak to them in a mighty and wonderful way. May they give their lives to you. So, Lord, we thank you for this time this morning where we can, we can spend a moment just removed from everything else that's going on and just spend it with you. And I pray, Lord, that as we have done that, that you have met with those, that you have given them the answer that they were seeking. And we just ask these things in your wonderful and powerful name. In the name of Jesus, we pray this. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. At this time, if you are in pre-K through fifth grade, you are going to be dismissed to head back into the powerhouse area for your time of, of worship this morning. So if you want to make your way there, that would be excellent. Well, good morning. It's great to be with you this morning. Glad that you are here. I'm glad to see your smiling faces here in the sanctuary, but I'm also very glad about those who are watching us on live stream this morning or maybe watching us later on today or throughout the week. Actually, I had a woman come to me on Friday morning and she said, I just watched your service this morning as I was eating breakfast. And I thought, well, <laughs> you either had a good breakfast or a bad breakfast. I'm not sure which one. I didn't ask her. But so these services are being watched uh, far beyond Sunday morning. And uh, we just give God praise for that. We give God praise for the technology uh, that we have in order to do that and the new technology that we have received. And, 
and just a great way of being able to share the gospel with people who are not able to be here. And uh, so we're just thankful for that. And thankful for those people who have put it all together and continue to work it week after week. You know, I sent out a church update letter earlier this week, and I hope that you received it either by mail or email. For those who have emails, it's much cheaper for the church to be able to send it out that way. So we send a lot of those letters out and communication in that way. And hopefully you got it. We send out, still send out mail to those who do not have email, and so hopefully you received it. If you have not gotten a chance to read it yet, I ask that you would please do so. But the old adage goes that the only thing that is constant is change. And this year, 2020, has proved that to be very true. It's changing all the time. I had the letter sent out. I think Pat sent it out Wednesday morning, Wednesday afternoon. The governor held a press conference, and he made some changes to some of the guidelines in relation to the virus. So this morning, we are adding this postscript to the letter that you received this past week. Uh, we'll give it to you verbally this morning. It will also go out in written form later on in the week for those who may not have heard it. But the statement goes like this. We have been privileged these last couple months to be able to worship together again as well as providing our services online for those who are unable to join us. And we're excited to continue to offer both of those options as we continue moving forward. As you're likely aware, our governor has asked us all to take an additional precaution by wearing masks beginning Monday morning, July 27th, which is tomorrow. In a desire to be a respectful and a cooperative part of our community, we will be making a few adjustments to the way in which we interact with each other here at Sunlight. Starting next Sunday morning, August 2nd, you will see our staff members wearing masks or face shields. You do not have to wear both, either a mask or a face shield in the foyer. We're also recommending that any volunteer staff who are greeting people in the foyer join us in wearing either a mask or face shield as well. For all of those who are joining us for Sunday school or worship, we are recommending that you also wear a mask or a face shield when entering our building until you reach your seat in the classroom or the sanctuary, and then you may remove it if you would like, or you can continue to wear it if you would like to do that. We fully understand that for some, it is a medical impossibility to wear a mask, and in those cases, they will be exempt. At this time, we're also recommending that children eight years old and older should wear a mask or a face shield as this follows the state and the school mandates until they enter into their classroom or the sanctuary. Likewise, when leaving and fellowshipping, we're encouraging you to put your face mask back on as you fellowship. We understand and recognize that there are strong opinions on the use of masks on both sides of this issue. And uh, we look to Scripture in our, in our guidance on this, and in Scripture it tells us to do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interest, but each to, of you to the interest of others. We find those words in Philippians 2, 3, and 4. So we endeavor to think the best of others and see our security in Christ as an opportunity to serve not only each other, but also our community. So that is the official statement that we have, are giving to you this morning. When this came down, I was in contact with some other pastors within our, con within our uh, area, and we spoke about this, and each one of us were dealing with the same issues, and this was a compilation of those talks uh, so we are not only doing that, but there are other churches uh, around our community doing the exact same thing. So during this time, we are praying that this thing will end very, very quickly. We're also praying that we extend grace to everyone who is here and hope that you feel that this is not something that is, uh, is an inconvenience, but it is something that we need to do in order to work within our community and, uh, and follow those guidelines uh, that have been sent down to us. So if you have any questions or comments, you can come and talk to me uh, at any time. I'll be glad to talk to you. Um, this was sent to our LBA and also our ministry leadership team, so they were aware of this uh, statement before this morning. So we just ask that uh, we would all just pray for each other uh, through this time, and we'll get through this, and uh, there'll be a time where we don't have to worry about face masks or shields or anything else. Uh, but that's where we stand right now. Well, I don't know about you, but I 
would re much rather talk about and speak about spiritual matters instead of COVID. That's what we're here for. So I want to jump into our message this morning. And our message comes from 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 21 through 25. So I would hope that you would join me there this morning, either by opening your Bible, turning on your handheld device, or just watching on the screen above me. But that's where we're going to be this morning. In 1896, a man by the name of Charles M. Sheldon penned the words of what has become a classic, inspirational, and best-selling novel titled In His Steps. In that story, Sheldon retells of, the serials, of a serial sermon story he used to read at a Sunday evening gatherings. It's the story of a local church whose members pledged for an entire year not to do anything without first asking the question, what would Jesus do if he were in my place? Following Christ's example brought great joy to this small town congregation, but it also brought misunderstanding, conflict, and difficulty. It meant entire dedication of money, talent, career, and influence to the cause of Christ. And then a hundred years later, in his steps, swept the world like wildfire and became responsible for one of the most widely recognized acronyms in Christian history, WWJD, What Would Jesus Do? And the central concept behind the wildly popular fad in Sheldon's original work is found in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21, where Peter says that Jesus left an example for you to follow in his steps. Well, this morning we come and we're not so much concerned, we're less concerned about what Jesus would do and more concerned about what Jesus did and is still doing even today. Verse 21 is just part of an entire paragraph that Peter dedicates to what Jesus has done for all the world and is continuing to do for his followers. So let's read this incredible passage, starting in verse 21 of chapter 2 of 1 Peter, and this is what it says. To this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their... Having trouble getting it to... There we go. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of our souls. What an encouraging passage for the readers of Peter's letter. At first, Peter was opposed to Christ's suffering on the cross. He did not want it to happen, did not believe it should happen. But then he learned an important lesson, which he in turn uses to give confidence to us today. Peter encourages us by, by presenting three pictures of Jesus Christ. First, Peter shows us that Jesus is our standard in life. Jesus is our standard in life. As Charles Sheldon pointed out, Jesus left an example for us to follow in his steps. And Jesus is a standard by which every man and woman will be measured. All that Jesus did on earth, as recorded in the four Gospels, is a perfect example of, for us to follow. But he is especially our example in the way that he responded in suffering. In spite of the fact that he committed no sin, nor was there any deceit found in his mouth, he suffered at the hands of the Jewish and the Roman authorities. I wonder how many of us, how we would have responded if we were in the same circumstances. We know that Peter drew his sword and cut off an ear. So it suggests that if Peter had been in charge, he might have fought rather than give in to the will of God, as, as Jesus did. Jesus proved that a person could be obedient to the will of God be greatly loved by God, and still suffer unjustly. 
There's a shallow brand of popular theology today that claims that, that Christians will not suffer if they are in the will of God. That as long as we are good Christians, nothing bad will happen to us. Now those who promote such ideas have not spent a lot of time meditating on the cross. Yet our Lord's humiliation and submission were, were not an evidence of weakness, but of great power. Jesus could have summoned at any time the armies of heaven to rescue him. At Easter time, you might hear the song, he could have called 10,000 angels to set him free and destroy the world to set him free, but he did not. He chose instead to fulfill his destiny. His words to Pilate in John 18 are proof that he was in complete command of the situation. It was Pilate who was on trial, not Jesus. Jesus had committed himself to the Father, and the Father always judges righteously. No one living today is capable of measuring up to the standard of Jesus that Jesus set. He was without sin. Sinners need a Savior, not a standard. But after a person is saved, he or she will want to follow in his steps and imitate the example of Christ. So what we talk about when we talk about transformation, when you give your life to Christ, you, you give him everything, and then there's a transformation that takes place so that you can become more like him. Charles Spurgeon said this. He says, a Christian should be a striking likeness of Jesus Christ. We should be pictures of Christ. He says, oh, my brethren, there is nothing that can so advantage you Nothing can so prosper you, so assist you, so make you walk rapidly toward heaven, so keep your heads upright towards the sky and your eyes radiant with glory like the imitation of Jesus Christ. And then the Bible says in Romans 8, 28 and 29, it says, and we know, and we know now that in all things God works for the good of those who love him who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. There's a story that's told of a, of a very large man who went to an exercise and diet clinic. And the first thing his trainer did was draw a silhouette on a mirror in the shape that this man wished he was. And as he stood before the mirror, he bulged all out over the silhouette. And the instructor told him, our goal is for you to fit in this shape. For many weeks, the man dieted and exercised. Each week, he would stand in front of the mirror, but his volume, while decreasing, still overflowed. And so he exercised harder, dieted more rigidly. But in front of the mirror, he was conformed to Time and hard work to continue. Exercise of pain, the trials conform us to his image. And what Jesus is by nature, we can be by grace as we follow in his steps. And so the first picture that we get of Christ is that he is a standard in our life. And the second is that Jesus is our substitute in death. Peter expressed, his, expressed Christ's substitutionary sacrifice with great feeling. In verse 24, he said, He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. Our Lord died as the sinner's substitute. Jesus did not die as a martyr. He died as a savior, a sinless substitute for people who in no way deserved him. The word translated bore means to carry as a sacrifice. So Jesus carried our sin to the cross, died in our place. And the Jewish people, they did not crucify criminals. They stoned them to death. But if the victim was especially evil, his dead body was hung on a tree until evening as a mark of shame and indignity. And the Bible says in Galatians 3.13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. Jesus died on a tree, died on a cross, and he bore the curse and the shame of the law. 
You know, I will forever remember a song that George Bernard wrote, the hymn that he wrote. I heard it as, at a young age. My grandfather on my mom's side died at a very early age for him of a heart attack. And so I was very young as well when I first heard this song. It was at his funeral service. And the song goes something like this. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. Oh, that old rugged cross so despised by the world has a wondrous attraction for me. For the dear Lamb of God left his glory above to bear it to dark Calvary. And that old rugged cross stained with blood so divine, a wondrous beauty I see. For twas on that old cross Jesus suffered and died to pardon and sanctify me. To the old rugged cross I will ever be true, its shame and reproach gladly bear. Then he'll call me someday to my home far away, when his glory forever I'll share. The chorus of that song is, so I'll cherish the old rugged cross, till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. The paradoxes of the cross never cease to amaze us. Christ was wounded that you and I might be healed. He died that you and I might live. We're crucified with him, and thus we die to sin so that we might live with him. The healing Peter mentions in this verse, at the end of the verse, is he's not talking about a physical healing. One day, yes, we will have glorified bodies, all sickness will be gone, all illness and pain will be gone. But what Peter was speaking about here was not a physical healing, but a spiritual healing of the soul. Centuries before Jesus was born, Jeremiah prophesied in Jeremiah 8.22, where he said, is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then is there no healing for the wounded of my people? Jesus was the fulfillment of that prophecy. There is a balm in Gilead to make the wounded whole. There is a balm in Gilead to heal the sin-sick soul. It's not the master teacher or Jesus the perfect example that saves us, but Jesus the spotless lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. In life, he was our standard. He is our standard. In death, he is our substitute. And even now, Peter tells us that Jesus is also our shepherd in heaven. Which is the third picture of Christ. Peter writes in verse 25, he says, For you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. In the Old Testament, the sheep died for the shepherd, but at Calvary, the shepherd died for the sheep. Jesus himself said in John 10, 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for a sheep. Every lost sinner and every wayward Christian is like a sheep gone astray, ignorant, lost, wandering, in danger away from the place of safety and unable to save themselves. The shepherd came to earth and searched for his lost sheep. He died for them. And now that we have been returned to the fold and safely in his care, he watches over us lest we stray and get into problems again. He watches over us. The Savior in his glory watches over his sheep to protect them and perfect them. David wrote beautifully about Jesus' role as shepherd and guardian of our souls in the 23rd Psalm where he says, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. And even though I walk in the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You know, sheep are said to be very unintelligent animals. I'm not sure about that, but I do know that they're very timid, defenseless, and helpless. They're always getting lost. They're always getting hurt. They literally do not know enough to come in out of the rain. 
and then have God tell us that we are sheep, we could really be insulted. But if we were totally honest with ourselves, we would know that it's true. I know that I lack wisdom and strength at times. I know my tendency is to go my own way and do my own thing. And I know that I'm in need of a shepherd. Here in Psalm 23 is a picturesque scene of a bunch of sheep bedded down in grassy meadows having eaten their fill and now totally satisfied. And then being led by still waters. You see, sheep are afraid of drinking from running water, so they have to be led to a quiet pool. Jesus cares for our inner needs. He, claim, he calms our fears. He gives direction to our lives, guiding us in right paths of righteousness. Jesus is our great protector and, and guardian of our souls. Corey Ten Boom said this. She said, when Jesus takes your hand, he keeps you tight. When Jesus keeps you tight, he leads you through your whole life. And when Jesus leads you through your life, he brings you safely home. Before ascending into heaven, Jesus announced that I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. The Bible goes on and says, God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. And as our shepherd laid down his life for us, and as long as we remain within his fold, he will guard our hearts and minds, and our souls will never be in danger. For Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. As we consider what Jesus has done, is continuing to do even today, it's no wonder we call him our Savior. For in life, Jesus is our standard, the example which we all must follow. In death, Jesus is our substitute, the spotless Lamb of God who bore our sins in his body on the cross. And in heaven, Jesus is our shepherd, the guardian of our souls. Here then is the wonderful truth that Peter wanted to share. As we live godly lives and submit in times of suffering, we are following in his steps and becoming more like him. We trust and obey not only for the sake of lost souls and for the Lord's sake, but also for our own sake, that we might grow spiritually and become more like Christ. The unsaved world is watching us, but the shepherd in heaven is also watching over us, so we have nothing to fear. We can trust in him and know that he will work everything together for our good and his glory. So have you been following the example of Jesus? We don't hear that acronym much anymore, WWJD, but it's just as true today as it was in 1869 when it was first penned. Are we following? Are we doing what Jesus would want us to do? Are we living the way Jesus would desire us to live? Are we striving to be more like him? Have you been crucified him? with him have you have you made him your shepherd and guardian are you washed in the blood of the lamb if not then we need to make those adjustments in our life this morning as peter is telling us that we have someone who is a standard for us to follow we have someone who has a substitute for us who has taken all the pain of the sin that was rightfully ours and has taken it away from us. And we now have a shepherd who is watching over us and waiting to welcome us home with him. Are we doing what God is asking us to do? Are we following in his steps? As we close this morning, that's the question I want to be on your heart. Are you following in his steps? If, if you are saying, I am following Christ, I am doing the things that God wants me to do, I, I am trusting him, I am giving my life to him, then I ask for you to do one thing for me this morning. I'm asking you to pray. Pray for those who may not be able to answer in the same way. If you're here this morning and you're saying, you know, I'm, I'm really not following in his steps. I'm not even sure what his steps are then I would ask that you would take some time during our closing prayer this morning and just spend some time with him, either at an altar or where you're at, and just say, Lord, I want to follow you. Help me to be able to do that. And then I want you to speak to someone after the service 
and just say, this was my prayer. I'm, I'm not sure where to go. I'm not sure what my next step is. Will you help me with that? And I think they will do that. So as we come to the end of this message, we need to realize that Peter is saying, we're not alone in this world. There's all kinds of things that are going on, but you're not alone. We just need to follow in his steps and the steps of Christ, and he'll help us through. Will you pray with me, please? Lord, as we come to you this morning, we just ask that you would just speak to each person here in this sanctuary. Lord, for those who are following in your steps, who are following you and living their life following you, then Lord, I just thank you for them. I thank you for their example. I thank you for their heart. And Lord, I thank you for their prayers right now as they are praying for those who may not be in that same point. So Lord, I would ask that you would just come upon us this morning and that you would just fill us with your spirit. The Lord, for those who are not following you this morning, I ask, Lord, that you, you just stop them just for a moment and just speak directly to them. And just impress upon them, Lord, their need to, to give their life to you, to follow you. Things may not be going well in their life right now, and they may be wondering, what do I do? Where do I go? What's my next step? Lord, may they hear from you this morning and realize that you are their next step. You are their final step. They just need to come to you and say, Lord, I would need you to lead me. I want to follow you. I want to imitate you. I want to accept you as my standard, as my substitute, as my shepherd. But Lord, I come to you right now just asking for your help. And so Lord, may you meet with them this morning as we come to a close of the service. We thank you, Lord, for Peter's words that he gives to us today and just ask that you would help us to meditate on them throughout this week to come. And we ask these things in your name. And all of God's children said, amen, amen. At this point of the service is where we uh, pray for our tithes and offerings as the praise team will be closing here in a, in a song in just a moment. Uh, this is a time where as we close and leave, uh, you can place your offering in the baskets at the back of the sanctuary by the doors as you leave. We also encourage you to tear off that back flap of your bulletin and mark your attendance here with us this morning. Any prayer requests or praises that you have, we invite you uh, to mark those down as well so we can pray for those throughout the week. And just once more, a word of thanks for your faithful giving uh, to the church, your faithful giving to God as uh, God continues to bless the church, continues to bless us and you uh, in your giving. And so we just want to say thank you for that. So uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer for our offering this morning. Lord, we want to thank you for those gifts that are going to be coming in today. We pray, Lord, that you will multiply them, that, Lord, that you will help us to use them in a way that your name will be glorified, your name will be lifted up, your name will be spread throughout our community so that more people will come to know you as Lord and Savior. So Lord, thank you for the gift that is going to be given. Thank you for the giver that is giving it. And we ask for your blessing to be upon them. And we ask these things in your name. Amen.
thank you, Lord, for allowing us to be here this morning. We just ask now that you just travel with us, that you be with us throughout this week to come. And we give all of it to you in praise and glory. And all of God's children said, Amen. Amen. You are dismissed. Have a wonderful week. God bless.